Christian nationalism in our public schools. This forum is being streamed and recorded. We have three speakers who will each speak for 15 minutes, after which we will open the floor for questions. Our first speaker will speak on the history of attempts to import religion into Southwest Florida public schools. David Silverberg is a veteran journalist who spent over 30 years covering topics in Washington, D.C. After moving to Naples in 2013, he was disturbed by what he saw as inadequate political reporting in Southwest Florida. Since 2018, his blog, The Paradise Progressive, has covered stories that might otherwise remain unreported. Please join me in welcoming David Silverberg. Thank you very much. Um, I'll, I'll keep this uh, very brief. But, you know, to just give an example of the kind of Christian nationalism creeping into Collier County, um, I attended a uh, coffee in the morning uh, held by one of our commissioners, uh, Chris Hall, commi uh, District 2, um, I, of which I am a member. And uh, we went over, you know, everything related to the county, the traffic, the, the utilities, had various presentations by uh, people, you know, administering these things. And then in the middle of it, apropos of absolutely nothing, Chris Hall gets up and says, there is no separation of church and state. Uh, now, maybe the fact that we had an invocation at the outset of this coffee in Jesus' name should have given me a little indication. But what it was was an indication of the movement, which we call Christian nationalism here in Collier County. And it, it's pretty active. It's uh, especially driven by two people. Uh, now, I, I had a talk here last week, so I'll, I may be going over some, of, some uh, territory. One, of course, is Alfie Oaks, the owner of Seed to Table, grocer, very, very conservative, uh, and who was at, at one time a state uh, political committeeman for the Republican Party. <clears throat> but he has been pushing all aspects of the, the MAGA agenda, including Christian nationalism, and in, intruding religion into our, uh, what are otherwise secular activities. Um, he backed two commissioners uh, on the county, Collier County Board of Commission, um, and they both won, Chris Hall, one of them, and Dan, Dan Cole, the other. <clears throat> and also he backed people with his uh, Citizens Awake Now pack, the CAN pack, um, which funded their at their campaigns. Now, when it came to the school board, he backed uh, Tim Mosher in 2022, uh, Jerry Rutherford, and um, uh, the, uh, the person who is na now the chair, um, uh, 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 Kelly, uh, Kelly Mason. Kelly was Lichter, now is Mason. I'm sorry for that momentary lapse. All three were backed by him. All three were expected to pursue a very, a very conservative and potentially Christian nationalist agenda on the school board. And then Kelly Mason suddenly didn't quite follow his dictates. And the, the place where that became a battle was over the appointment of the superintendent, uh, Rick Yardelli, uh, Leslie Rick Yardelli. And in fact, when Kelly uh, cast the deciding vote. He called her a traitor. And, you know, you wonder, who is she betraying? She's not betraying the parents. She's not betraying the teachers. She's not betraying the, the students or the staff. She betrayed him because he had wanted a different candidate who would pursue an agenda more to his liking. So that was the first element of rebellion. And <clears throat> then last year, we had a big debate on the school board over whether there would be an invocation or a prayer prior to the meetings. They, they do a moment of silence. That wasn't enough, especially for Rutherford. <clears throat> and Rutherford, uh, he wanted a prayer. And what this did was this debate opened up the whole, uh, I hesitate to say can of worms, but all the issues involved in, in um, 
inserting religion into what are otherwise secular activities. Because if you're going to have an invocation, who's going to deliver it? What are they going to say? Uh, what denomination will they be from? How can you make it you know, uh, equitable to all the people in the, in the community and into Collier County? And they spent hours on this debate. They sent it to the staff to study other, other jurisdictions and how they did it. And one of the, the vaguely amusing things was Jerry Rutherford wanted a prayer before the, um, the meetings. <clears throat> and the way he did it was he said he wanted to hold the prayer. He always kept track of all the prayers he made. And then he wanted to wait until the prayer was answered. And now, I was thinking, you know, <laughs> I've, I've been praying for world peace for a while. <laughs> and yeah, right now I'm praying that the lights go on in my home. But I'm not going to stop everything I do until that happens. And he, he actually wanted to do that. And you, you wondered, oh, my God, you know, how are they going to get anything done? In the end, they didn't have an invocation. In the end, the vote was against doing it. They stay with a moment of silence, and it should be fine for everyone. But it was an indication of the intrusion and the disruption that this kind of intrusion of a, of a particular denominational religion into what's otherwise should be a secular proceeding. And by the way, Tim Mosher and, and Jerry Rutherford, when it came to the nut, nuts and bolts of running the school board, as in dealing with budgets and looking at spreadsheets and all the rest, they were nowhere to be found. They hadn't read it. They hadn't looked at it. That wasn't really what they cared about. And Kelly Mason really took them to task for, for that kind of absence, because that's the real job of a school board, is to keep the, the school system running. Uh, now, in the, the last election, in the primary, there were two MAGA, Alfie Oaks-backed candidates, Pam Cunningham and another guy, I'm sorry about names today, uh, both, the main point being that they both lost to real professionals who had sat on the school board, Stephanie Lucarelli and Eric Carter. And that, with the vote of Kelly Mason, should keep the school board on what is a relatively stable, secular uh, course that, that emphasizes the education of, of the children of Collier County, which is what we want. Hopefully, the, this last uh, surge of, of um, Christian nationalism aimed at the school board will, I hope, die down at least for the next two years. And I have a feeling that after this next election, there won't be quite the passion and the, the intensity that we've seen up until now. Or at least it will be more um, put off to the side, let's say. I don't know that that's necessarily going to be the, the case, but it's a somewhat hopeful sign. But Collier County has come through what you know, the Duke of Wellington called a close-run thing with his school board in those 22 elections, and much depends upon Kelly Mason maintaining a course that, that keeps it secular and aimed at educating the children and not indoctrinating them the way other people would like. So that's the state of play right now. But the thing that we always have to monitor and we'll have to keep monitoring is the intrusion of religion into into government. I mean, Thomas Jefferson talked about building a wall of separation in an 1802 letter, <clears throat> and that wall of separation has served this country so well throughout its history, and there are people trying to break it down now, and hopefully that the majority of, of the folks who vote and the ge general sentiment of the community will keep that from happening and damaging the education that the children of Collier County need and deserve. So that's, that's my, my um, report up to this point. Is this on? Yep. Our second speaker will reflect on his experience of Christian nationalism from the perspective of a classroom teacher. Michael Andosha is a former Lee County school teacher with over 30 years experience. This last January, Michael resigned his position in protest after over 600 books were physically removed from his classroom library. 
He now get, dedicates his time to advocating for teachers and the restoration of academic freedom. Please welcome Michael Andosha. Am I able to stand? Can I? Yeah, I'm good. Okay, I guess I can't. Yeah, I can. <laughs> That's right. I'm, I'm very kinesthetic. I, I, talking and sitting, I'm not, I'm not good at. So, all right. Um, yeah, so my books were removed uh, on, well, during the weekend of Martin Luther King holiday. Uh, when I went into my classroom on Tuesday, that was the first indication that something was wrong. My books were gone. Uh, <laughs> I texted my wife. And, uh, and she had some very choice things to say about it as well. And um, uh, that was Tuesday. Wednesday, I gave my resignation. Wednesday was also when I discovered that I was under investigation by the district. Right. Um, and then Thursday was the last day of my career. So I guess that was Thursday the 18th or something like that. I think that was it. That was the la that last day of my, of my 30 year career. Uh, any educators in the room? Okay, very good. Oh, excellent, excellent. Very good. Uh, I was teaching uh, sociology, advanced sociology, a sociology. As a matter of fact, I was teaching honors economics, and I was teaching philosophy. So all, most of my classes were advanced courses, yes. And, um, and I had no idea. I didn't know what was going on. And this is, this is interesting because we're talking about Christian nationalism, and there is this movement, and it's a long-term movement. We can, we can go all the way back to John T. Scopes, in, uh, in the 1920s, 1925, uh, was a teacher who was removed, he was actually put in jail for, uh, for teaching evolution in a science class. Now, he was a plant, and he did that intentionally, and he was doing that to, to, to challenge the law. Um, my experience is not necessarily directly with Christian nationalists, but the, um, but, but the, the trickle-down of it. Because, see, my, my principal is the one who uh, had the books removed from my classroom. She is not a Christian nationalist. She is a good person who's just trying to do a very difficult job under very difficult political circumstances. And this is where we're talking about the politics and the, and the, the movement politics making its way into our schools. Much of the enforcement of these policies are based on state policies that have been passed into law and signed into law. They're vaguely worded. We don't really know what the tenets of the laws mean, but we kind of know what the tenets of the laws mean, right? We know that it's in what, what is intended. We know when they say that you can't put um, symbols on your walls, we know what symbols they're talking about. They're talking about, the, they're talking about pride flags. Now, they don't specifically say that because you can't say that. They're not talking about, you know, any other, um, you know, attribution to to right-wing politics, including Christian nationalism or authoritarian nationalism or whatever you want to call it. I like to call it fascism myself, but that's just me, right? And uh, so I didn't know what was going on. I'll show you what actually set all of this off. You want to see the text message that set all this thing off? Uh, oops. Here we go. I hope, I don't know if you can read. I, I enjoy reading it, so if you don't mind, to, to humor me, it says, hey, by the way, this was a, uh, I didn't have this information at hand. It took me a few weeks to get this information. Uh, when I learned that I was under investigation, I wasn't informed as to why I was under investigation. I was told that the investigation would be conducted, and then after the investigation was over, I would get to have a say. I'd, have, I'd get to tell my side of the story. Because I guess Kafka has not been approved by the uh, Lee County School System yet. So, uh, so this is uh, this. It turns out, so I, I, I filed a public information request, and I learned that this was this was it. This was the moment that changed my career. Uh, I know who did, who sent this. This person was is a um, Moms for Liberty type activist. Uh, she isn't. It, she's not specifically with Moms for Liberty, but a, a Moms for Liberty type. Um, group, which of course has ties to Christian nationalism. It says, hey, I know you're busy. This, by the way, this text was sent to the deputy, um, the deputy superintendent. Text it. So this, is, so this activist had the cell phone number of the deputy superintendent. All right. Hey, I know you're busy and I hate to bother you, but my daughter just got home from work and we were talking about school. She has a new class, economics, and I have a huge capital problem with her teacher and I need you to talk me off a ledge because I am level 10 mad. That's pretty good. 
Level 10, I can usually only get them to level six or seven. <laughs> level 10 is actually really, really good. So uh, it says, uh, this teacher, in quotes, started the class today by offering to use whatever pronouns the students wanted. He made a point to tell them that he doesn't care what the governor says. He also has two bookshelves in his classroom, a green for district approved books and a red for banned capitals books. Uh, he told them to choose any bookshelf they wanted, which I don't know why I would have a red or a green if you, but anyway. And to top it off, he stressed the importance of voting because they're all going to be 18 if not already. So one can only imagine the political garbage he's going to be force feeding them all semester. This is blatant insubordination and I am beyond livid. I'm not entirely sure what's, what, what is beyond livid, but she was there. All right. uh, so now, she got a lot of the underlying facts are, are not quite right, uh, but let's just kind of take a look at, at the core of her, of her argument. The core of her argument is, I was allowing students to read books, I was treating all of my students with respect, and I mentioned voting in an economics class. We vote on economics is what we'll logically what we vote, vote on, right? And by the way, this was the first day of the semester. This was the day I, I was going over the syllabus. Now, if she wanted to, uh, if she was really concerned, if she, she was really trying to imagine what I was going to be talking about in class, she could have resolved that very easily. By reading the syllabus that I was going over that day, I literally, I mean, my, my syllabi were always meticulous. I had my syllabus broken down by the day as to what we were going to be talking about. And this was an economics class. Um, so th these were her, her concerns. Now, I don't want, I, I try really hard. I was very, very angry with this, with this woman. Um, and I try very hard not to let anger cloud my judgment. So I try, I'm trying to give her the benefit of the doubt. And what do I see? What I, what I, I see is this concern about indoctrination. This parent, I don't know, she is an activist. She's fairly well known, I'm not gonna share her name, but she's fairly well known in Lee County. And, um, and I, giving her the benefit of the doubt, I have to say, you know, if I were concerned that my teachers were indoctrinating my children, I would wanna do something about that. I would want to address that. Now she's wrong. And in fact, she's, she's demonstrably wrong. Even if we as public school teachers were capable of indoctrinating your kids, we wouldn't be able to do it. Trust us, their essays would look a lot better if we were able to. <laughs> they would turn in their homework a lot better, a lot more often if we were able to indoct. My students would stop using the phrase, some may say in their essays. If I could indoctrinate my, your children, I can't do it, right? Now, there was an author uh, some time ago, his name was uh, uh, Juice Merlu. Uh, he was writing after, after the Korean War, actually. And uh, he was writing on the topic of uh, indoctrination. And he came up and he was, he was a, a psychologist who specialized in, in what it takes to indoctrinate. And what he was actually studying uh, prisoners of war who came back from the Korean War and had been indoctrinated. And, they, and he came up with these ideas. And uh, these um, systems have to be in place in order for us to indoctrinate your children, right? And, I mean, I, to, be, to be fair, you, you can. If you go into a public school system, you, you can see some of this stuff in play, right? Um, but we as public school teachers, what we try to do is we do the best we can to mitigate these elements in, in any school. And the fact that for me, for me as a high school teacher, for instance, I have your students 46 minutes a day. There's no way I can indoctrinate them, even if I wanted to. But if you actually break down these categories, what you see is those folks, those activists, like the, the woman who sent the text message on me, or Christian nationalists, or authoritarian nationalists, or fascists, or whatever you want to call them, this is exactly what they're doing. This is the kind of school that they're setting up, right? Indoctrination, right? Repetition and regurgitation. I can always tell when I'm talking to somebody who has absolutely no background in education because they, they say this, teachers should just teach the facts, right? 
If you're an educator in the room, you, you understand that that is just the worst kind of thing. You, that's the last thing you want to do is just teach the facts. Why? The facts are boring, <laughs> right? You're, you would lose your students within eight and a half seconds of your class. And secondly, because we're professional educators and we know the research on education, we understand that actually human beings are really lousy at learning facts. We really don't do it well. We have to have a context in order for us to learn facts. We need to have the stories. That's why journalists don't write a list of the facts of what they know. What they do is they put it in context. They tell a story because that's how you're going to learn it, right? So this is what we're, what we're doing. And if you take a look at what Christian nationalists are, are, are doing or uh, the laws that are being passed... This is exactly what they're doing. Their fear isn't that teachers are indoctrinating their students. The fear is that the teachers are not indoctrinating the students the way they want the students indoctrinated. So, I mean, we can, we can take now some of the language that we're, that's being used right now. You can kind of take a look. If you go to any of the school board hearings, um, school board meetings, I strongly recommend that you do that. You're going to hear some of these terms. Uh, we have to protect the children. Right, we're going to protect the children from what? Well, we're going to protect the children from teachers. Right. Now, and then the story that they're telling, of course, we're going to protect the children from pornography. Because there's just teachers are just handing out pornography in the class. I don't know what the... I, I never had that teacher in my class. Uh, um, but if you actually take a look, so I, I had the opportunity to go through the list of the books, the rejected titles. I'm going to use that. Keep an eye on the language that's being used, right? Rejected titles. Those are banned books. Those are banned books, right? So the banned books, I went through a list of them. There's over 500 of them that were uh, rejected in uh, Lee County, right? And of those, 0% of those books were pornographic. Only fewer than 15% of those books on that list addressed sex or sexuality at all. Many of the books, like Howard Zinn's A People's History of the United States, was rejected because it needed further review. No, it didn't. You just don't like the book and you're rejecting it. You can't say, I'm rejecting it because it's written by a lefty, right? So we're seeing this here, um, protecting the children, not making the students uncomfortable. That's, that's great. You know, kids, we're we're going to sit these kids in these one-armed bandits for 46 minutes, and, but we don't want to make them uncomfortable, right? Um, value neutrality, this is the new one. Classrooms need to be value neutral, not entirely sure how that works. I, I've, I've asked the school board members, I've asked various officers in the school district what value neutral means, and nobody's able to tell me because it doesn't mean anything, right? It's a perfect propaganda uh, statement if you take a look at uh, Noam Chomsky and Ed Herman's uh, theories on propaganda. These are statements that you can make, you, can, you can't argue with because they don't mean any, they don't actually mean anything. Right, value neutrality. I had a post. I have a poster of the um, the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. That is not a value-neutral statement. Does that have to come down? Uh, uh, no. They're talking about pride flags. They're talking about pride flags uh, and keeping politics out of the classroom. The, the classroom exists because of politics. My job is dependent on politics. I get paid by politicians, right? The curriculum that I teach is decided upon by politicians oftentimes, and oftentimes not by politicians who have a background in what I'm teaching, right? So what I'm advocating for is, well, we take a look at what's happening to teachers right now, and what's happening is, is they're living under what I, well, we can refer to as a sort of Damocles, right? Every single teacher understands that they are one text message away from their career being changed. Right? And that hangs over their head. So what are they doing? Well, they're protecting themselves. They're defending themselves. They're removing the books from their classrooms. They're eliminating debate from their classrooms. They're avoiding controversial issues. They're swapping out some of the literature that they use in their classrooms that are, that's interesting and they're replacing it with the most anodyne, um, you know, stuff 
in order to protect themselves. Literally, I've had teachers remove all of the books from their classrooms because they don't want to get in trouble. They've removed all of the posters from their classrooms because they don't want to get into trouble. It's self-defense. And the obvious solution to this, and the obvious solution to even the concern from the parent who sent the text message is academic freedom is a small d democratic process of, of knowledge and understanding of knowledge and teaching and education. Learning and teaching through inquiry. Uh, learning and teaching through, um, through engagement. And uh, so this is what I'm advocating for. I'm also, uh, right now I'm advocating for a policy change in Lee County by which if a parent has a complaint about a teacher, that parent has to talk to the teacher, demonstrate that they've tried to resolve that complaint with the teacher first, before sending a text message to the deputy superintendent. <laughs> so, so far, I've not gotten anywhere, but I'm still working on it. So, um, well, thank you very much. <laughs> Our last speaker has made it her mission to pay close attention to state laws and to fight the infiltration of religion into public schools. Dr. Amy Perwin has a doctorate in clinical psychology. In 2022, she decided that enough was enough and got involved as an advocate for public education and equality. She serves on the boards of Interfaith Alliance of Southwest Florida and Glisson Collier County and chairs the Naples Pride Advocacy Committee. Dr. Perwin is a regular speaker at school board meetings. Please welcome Dr. Amy Perwin. Thank you for the lovely introduction. Um, I will give a full disclosure that I am not an attorney. Um, I'm not a teacher, but I am a parent and I have a strong public education. So Christian nationalism, this group is probably pretty familiar with, but I just wanna remind that it's a cultural framework that conflates American identity with an ex exclusive form of religious identity. And the point that I want to point out here is this is what we're seeing that is actually motivating laws and policies. And it actually is working to exclude perspectives in our public schools and elsewhere, but I'm going to focus on public schools. So where are we seeing this? We've heard about book bans. We hear about banning of saying gay, saying trans. We have issues with bathrooms, of which bathroom you can use, what pronouns you can use. Are we going to have school chaplains? Is there going to be an invocation at our school board meetings? And vouchers. They are called family empowerment, but they are vouchers, and they siphon away money from public schools. We have arguments, discussions, which shouldn't be happening about teaching history. Most of us want our children, our grandchildren, and everyone in our community to know real history. There's bans on critical race theory without the actual understanding of what critical race theory actually is. And all this has resulted in teachers feeling fear, feeling silenced, and this is kind of in our climate and in our culture what's going on in our schools. So let's talk about how kind of this sort of framework happens. I think of it as levels. First of all, we have what's going on in Tallahassee, legislatively. What becomes statute? What becomes law? The second level I think of is what's happening at a Department of Education, and this is the Florida Department of Education who creates rules, guidance, and does trainings, including trainings for media specialists. And then we filter down to what's happening at our local level within our own school district in terms of policies and practices that are taken up. And overlaying all of that, we have to consider what happens with our Governor DeSantis and how that influences all of these different levels. Also, we have to consider what happens in terms of special interest groups. We have Florida Citizens Alliance, which is in Marco Island, which has been a big factor in influences of these various levels. Don't say gay. We've heard of the Don't Say Gay Bill. I'm going to cover that a little bit. I will also be covering the expansion of the Don't Say Gay. Some people refer to that as HB 1069. And I'm going to cover a little bit, if I have time, with school chaplains. That's just three of the bills that we've seen in the last few years. These are some of the rest of bills, of things that have come out from the Department of Education in terms of guidance, 
of what is coming down in terms of rules of what can be taught in history, and this has been going on for years, recent years. Mm -hmm. So let's start with the Don't Say Gay bill. Who here has heard of the Don't Say Gay bill? I think everyone has heard about it, read it in the newspapers. This was HB 1557. And the important part to note here is it says classroom instruction, and I'm going to come back to that in a minute. So it says classroom instruction on sexual orientation or gender identity may not occur in a manner that is not age appropriate or developmentally appropriate for students. In 2022, this is when this law was passed. And at that time, it was kindergarten through third grade. And everyone said, oh, we want to protect young children. Again, that protection mantra. Well, lo and behold, in 2023, that gets expanded. And now we're covering pre-K through eighth grade. And for good measure, the Department of Education in Florida put it kindergarten through 12th grade. And in 2024, we have actually a bright spot. We have the Don't Say Gay Settlement. And the Don't Say Gay Settlement took away most of the very terrible stuff of this bad bill, this bad law. So as of this point, you can say gay in school. They hammered pretty heavily on, you can be in classroom discussion, students can talk to each other, students can talk to teachers, it just can't be instruction. So this is actually an improvement. The pride stickers, the safe space stickers, are actually specifically covered under this settlement. And this was a settlement between the state of Florida and various parties. So we're still waiting to see how this is going to filter down, but this is something that we need to be pushing on. This is HB 1069. HB 1069 is a whole lot of things. I'm going to talk specifically about the book objection piece and the review process, and that's kind of what we're seeing, some of these impacts on the book bans. We have to go back a little bit in time. Miller versus California, Supreme Court decision that was a way to look at defining what obscenity means. The important parts of this are that it has to be all three of those pieces. So it has to predominantly appeal to a prurient interest. It has to be a community standard. So not just one person complaining, a community standard. And the third part of that prong is the piece of book, literature, or artwork has to be taken as a whole. This does not mean pulling out excerpts like single sentences, single paragraphs, taken as a whole. And it has to actually lack value in terms of literature, artistic, or scientific value. Three prongs, all three parts, to determine if something is obscene. So what does Florida do? Tries to circumvent this. <laughs> this is how we end up with HB 1069, and this was in 2023. So if you'll notice, I've highlighted some parts in this piece. We're now including classroom libraries. Well, I shouldn't say we, Tallahassee is. They left that out in a previous bill. So now they're including classroom libraries, which you are familiar with. And if you notice, there is an or in here. We no longer have our three prongs to determine obscenity or something that is obscene for kids. It can be pornographic, which, by the way, is not defined in any Florida statute. And I'll show you something. Even the Department of Ed mentions this in their training. They specifically use the definition from Merriam-Webster because Tallahassee did not create a definition for pornography. Yet here we have it. So if somebody determines that it's pornographic, that it describes or depicts sexual conduct, which is pretty vague, there is some further description in the statute, but it's pretty broad and vague. Intentionally, if you make something vague enough and scare people, they'll kind of do the rest. And the third one is, is not suited for students' needs, which again, very vague. So that's an or. So any of those can lead to a book being removed, banned, pulled, whatever you want to call it, they all result in students not having access to books. And this is the end result. So we can see nationwide, this is from Penn America, it's data from last school year, and you can see Florida is the dark spot. <laughs> <laughs> We're number one. <laughs> so what does this mean for Collier schools? This picture in the lower left corner is actually from my students 
one of my students' classrooms, my son. And this was a Spanish classroom, a high school Spanish class, third year Spanish, where the teacher didn't want to have to deal with putting his books through the review process. So yes, there actually are some empty bookshelves in schools. Classics have been pulled. Some of you probably have read these, or it's on your I should read list. <laughs> <laughs> And more importantly, actually, for our teenagers, there is a wealth of young adult literature that is written for this age group. As you can see from the gold and the silver, those are all award-winning books. These are not accessible to our Collier students. So I think, and I tell students all the time, of read the banned books. There's power in knowing what's in those books. School chaplains. Who's heard about the school chaplains? OK. So Tallahassee passed something this last legislative session that districts may adopt a volunteer school chaplain policy. May is important, so they do not have to. It's a may. And it says what needs to be included in that, that it has to describe the support services and programs. It requires principals to let parents know that the program exists and that there has to be written parental consent. All that's really required of the chaplain is they have to pass a background screening. And that background screening looks to me, from my read of it, similar to what you would pass as a volunteer parent in the school. So that's all Tallahassee is mandating, and that the district has to keep a list of the chaplains and their religious affiliation. That's it. And as you can see, there's only a page and a half for this legislation. So Florida Department of Education, at the end of August, decided to come out with a model policy. Part of the reason they probably did this is when this was signed into law, it was signed in Osceola County by DeSantis, who was very proud of this legislation. And Osceola County actually decided to not have a volunteer school chaplain program. And since that time, they have voted a second time to not have a volunteer chaplain program, <laughs> OK? So Florida, the Department of Ed actually is defining here what religion is. So it begs the question of who decides if the chaplain's religion is organized by a hierarchy? Who decides if the chaplain's religion worships a supernatural entity or entities? And who decides if that chaplain's religion imposes, and imposes moral duties? And what does that even mean? This is not a policy that protects students. And Department of Heads has two-sided policy, model policy on it. It doesn't protect students from proselytizing. And I will tell you, when Tallahassee was passing this legislation, there was an amendment for this bill that actually specifically prohibited proselytizing. And the, they voted against it. Legislative intent. It doesn't protect students from having a chaplain pray in front of them. It allows chaplains to do a broad range of services, mental health services, counseling services, with which they may have no background, no license, no expertise. It definitely does not protect our LGBTQ plus students from things like conversion therapy or praying away the gay. So what about Collier? As of this point, and this was a great overview of what's going on with our board, I'm a little more reluctant to say I feel in good shape with it. <laughs> I definitely feel in better shape after the election, but it's something definitely to watch. So we have a board member, Jerry Rutherford, who has been very opinionated in his views of religion, religion in the schools, bringing prayer back, wanting an invocation. And this has been repeated over the couple years I've been going to board meetings. So he actually brought up the chaplain policy within the context of a budget meeting. And during that budget meeting, he talked about that chaplains might be a good way to kind of solve this issue of not having enough psychologists and counselors for our students. That chaplains might be the way to kind of help some of these students that have fear, suicide, and other problems that the chaplain might be able to deal with. I was in the room when he said this, and I about fell out of my chair. <laughs> in a budget meeting. Budget meeting, 
small, 9.30 in the morning, maybe like five, 10 people in the audience. This stuff flies under the radar. This is why we watch our school board. <laughs> I want to talk a little bit, I was asked to talk a little bit about the last school board election. So, yes, I am an involved parent. Yes, I have an opinion. But I am not a politician. I am not somebody that actually likes to be in the public light. But I was dragged in by one of the school board candidates. And this is a candidate who, during one of the public forums, talked about how we need our students to kneel for, stand for the flag and kneel for the cross. And she's also been very upfront about her anti-LGBTQ stance. So she framed another Collier County mom and I as the radical left, and apparently we are so powerful that we are developing centers of progressive indoctrination. <laughs> and I was thinking, wow, I didn't know I could do that. But she put us in her campaign newsletter. And this there is the picture are. she used. This is actually copyrighted, so not, she didn't ask permission, obviously. But what triggered her was the rainbow you see in the background. And this other mother and I received an award that was a community award, not related to anything in Collier County Schools, but she used that to frame us as radicalists, activist mothers, and try to link us to her opponent. So, is the tide turning? At the state level, I think there are cracks in the facade. I agree with PEN America on this. Last year, legislative session was not nearly as brutal as the previous year. 21 of 22 bills um, that were anti-LGBTQ were either stopped or neutralized. And at the local level, we had our Collier County School Board election, which I'm happy with the results of, I'll share that. Uh, we also, the board voted against the invocation, as was previously mentioned. So what can we do? I'm just gonna quickly leave this up. I know I'm running out of time. Share information with your networks. People trust others that they know. Share information. Attend school board meetings, even if you can just go to one. See what it's like, see what's going on. Contact your elected officials. Now I know that we always get told, well, you know, send an email. Those things matter. When I was in Tallahassee, they said that they were getting emails from the other side. Sometimes it is a volume thing. Personalize those emails. Write letters to the editor. There are still people that read the newspaper. <laughs> and learn about legislation and make sure that you vote. So I'm giving you homework. If you don't already know, learn about Amendment 1. This would make our school board races partisan. That would make more politics in our school board elections. Learn about the tax neutral referendum for Collier County. This allows the district to shift money from capital funds into operating funds and helps give our teachers raises, helps support student programs. Learn about those two. If anyone does QR, anyone do QR codes here? Okay. But these, these are really important, and this is going to be on everyone's ballot in Collier County in November, and the partisan school board races is going to be on the state ballot. So make sure you're telling your networks about Amendment 1 and the tax-neutral referendum. And then the last thing I want to leave is extra credit. <laughs> I said I wasn't a teacher, but we're all... <laughs> These are some great books that if you want to do further reading on, um, learn about what we've been seeing the last few years. <sighs> I've read all three. And when I read the first one, they came for the schools, I loved it. And I immediately called a friend and said, you have to read this, because this explains what we've been going through the last few years. It covers Texas, but they are really kind of two sides of the same coin. Then I moved to Education Wars. And I like that one. <laughs> and there's a couple chapters in School Moms that I really love. They do a very good job of explaining what's going on with critical race theory. That was an excellent chapter. Um, so I don't know that I could really pick a favorite. Okay, thank you.
I, I just wanted to add a, a little uh, note you might find interesting to the chaplain issue. Mm -hmm. Because when they declared that there were going to be chaplains in the schools, there was something called the Church of Satan. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And the Church of Satan said, well, if your churches are going to have chaplains, we're going to have chaplains. And I don't quite know how it's resolved itself, if at all, but I know that they're resisting. But it's il illustrative of, of what happens when you open up mm -hmm. you know, a school system to religion or to any secular function and uh, how complicated it can get. We'll see if there are satanic chaplains in the schools. I will tell you, DeSantis actually specifically said no Yeah, he that, said no. Which yep. would he be can't. unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. right. I like to think of it as, I, there's a specific school board <clears throat> member in my mind that I'm not sure if he's more fearful of the humanists or the Wiccans. <laughs> <laughs> much to all of our speakers, we have a little time for some Q&A. Some questions from y'all. Come back with the mic. Hi. Um, this is for the teacher from Fort Myers. Who is doing the investigation? Is it a legal authority? And what is the outcome? That's a good question. So originally it was uh, being conducted by the school district of Lee County. Um, and I, um, I don't know what the disposition of that is. Now, once I resigned, uh, Lee County decided to drop the investigation. But because I was under investigation with the district, I was automatically under investigation with the state. So now the state is, uh, is investigating again. This is not, I'm getting the impression that this is not something that they're really excited about doing <laughs> in an election year. Um, so I have, um, I've heard nothing, nothing from anybody, really, about the investigation or anything of the sort. Uh, I have a, I, I've stuck with my union. I'm a union member. Uh, so um, my union is providing legal help, and my lawyer contacts me every once in a while just to let me know he's, he's still alive, uh, <laughs> but has said that he has seen no movement on my case at all at the state level, but I'm still under state investigation. Good morning. I um, really don't have a question. I just want to, my name is Vincent Keese, and I just want to um, emphasize that we've had a supermajority out of Tallahassee, and so they have had the ability to l force legislation right down our throats. And so um, overriding that is the Project 2025, which continues the agenda mm -hmm. throughout uh, the country. And so I would want to encourage everyone to not only attend the school board meetings, but to also become active members in the SAC meetings because Recently, at the last middle school SAC meeting I attended, they sent out a group of books and asked for our approval. I refused. I thought it was outrageous. You're going to now ask me for to approve this list that you gave to me, which was just out of order. And I wanted to know who was controlling their meeting. No one, no one was in control of the meeting. So uh, we need to become more aware and we need to become more active and become active on the issue of books down at the lowest possible level that you can get to and then carry it through to the school boards and above. Thank you. And I I would point out that we have the numbers. Most people agree with us. Um, almost, almost all of the feedback that I've gotten from my situation uh, has been positive and supportive. Um, you know, even and, and I'm, I'm talking across the political spectrum. So I've I've heard from conserv political conservatives, pro liberals, leftists. Um, they are all supportive. They don't want books banned from the schools. Sure. They don't want teachers to be censored. Um, 
So we, we have the numbers. It's a vocal minority that's pushing a lot of these laws. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing I'd like to point out <clears throat> on Project 2025, uh, I've been trying to take some deep dives into what it would mean specifically for us here in Collier County. And I did do a piece, if you want all the details, uh, it's Project 2025 and its impact on Collier County education. You can Google it, add the words uh, Paradise Progressive, and you'll see, um, among other things, you know, Project 2025 wants to abolish the Department of Education. And the actual impact of that would be financial because more than anything else, the Department of Education is a grant-making operation with a sort of a policy shop attached. Uh, Collier County gets seven, a little over $7 million in direct federal grants. So presumably that would disappear. It also gets $70 million in federal grants through the state. So there's no telling what would happen with that if you know, the, Department, the U.S. Department of Education was disestablished. Uh, and then there are, uh, there are a lot of other um, impacts, but mainly it's financial and it would definitely hurt the, the Collier County and every other school district in the country if they did that. I want to add something else to what project by de abolishing the Department of Education. Yeah. The Office of Civil Rights is within the Department of Education. So that's Title IX and Title mm -hmm. Four. I forget the, but those are protections and as of this Right now, Collier County actually had an Office of Civil Rights or an OCR complaint filed against it over book removals related to removal of books and climate related to LGBTQ students. So if we don't have that protection, I'm not sure that I fully trust Tallahassee to, no. to deal with that. I just want to thank you for being brave <laughs> and stand for something and stand up for the right reason. And teacher, do you have a job now? My, my job is, uh, <laughs> is I am my wife's uh, arm candy. <laughs> <laughs> because you have so much to teach. Yeah. I can see what a wonderful teacher you are. Thank you. Thank you. You're absolutely right about standing up. I will tell you, the, when I woke up in the morning, and I think it was on a Monday, and a friend <laughs> called and said, hey, have you seen Pam Cunningham's newsletter? I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> She's not gonna send that to me. So I got it forwarded, and I saw myself in there, and I had other calls of people saying, like, what are you gonna do, what are you gonna do? And in that moment, I said, you know, I wanna take some time a little bit during the day to kind of settle and think what my plan will be here like what to do, if anything. And I had that inkling of I wanted to do something because it was wrong, and I didn't want other people, other parents, other students to be unfairly attacked. So I ultimately decided to put a post on the Naples Moms Facebook page, which has 25,000 followers, just to make them aware of what had happened. And then after that, we had an interview with the Naples Daily News and with Wink, so it was very much out there. Interestingly, Pam Cunningham waited a couple days to even respond, and that response was not an apology, but it was a doubling down, which just to me shows kind of, you know, who she is as a person. But it did not feel comfortable to be going through that. And, but I just felt very strongly that some of us have to be standing up, because not everyone can. I am not a teacher, so I'm not at risk for being fired. I have a supportive family who allows me to do this. Because even though I do advocacy work, it's not without the support of my family. Yeah. Uh, if I can just say, after the election on August 20th, the primary, uh, Kelly Mason of the Collier County Board of Education called out some literature that it, of Pam Cunningham's uh, that, you know, accused the schools of indoctrination. And she finally said, all right, what is this indoctrination? I don't want to hear any more about it. And she asked Rutherford and she asked uh, Moshier, give me examples of, of indoctrination. They couldn't do it. And Moshier had some vague recollection of one of the uh, safe school posters up there. He, his she, specific example was a sticker. Was mm -hmm. a sticker. A sticker, a safe space sticker. And as I was sitting in the audience, the first thing I thought of, 
and that is now allowed under the settlement. Yeah, and, and so th there, was, there was no there there. And what Kelly Mason said was, all right, I don't want to hear about this anymore. And the, the literature was really vicious, and mm -hmm. I put a copy of it up on the Paradise Progressive uh, Facebook or, um, blog. But um, I don't know. I don't know if that'll be the end of it, but that certainly was a blow against it. That's part of the indoctrination mission, of course, yeah. right? To, to eliminate all other references to other ideas and other ways of thinking and making sure that there's only one narrow uh, way of thinking that, is, that we're allowed to teach or we're allowed to present. Which is framed under that Christian nationalist Value neutral. Idea. Right. Yep. Before we close, is there anything that you want to share that hasn't been brought up so far? And I see we have one more question over there. Cliff, you want to get that first? Uh, I just want to mention that the Naples United Church of Christ is forming a banned book library. Mm. So if you've got any of those books that are banned, they're taking them. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, if I could add one. Oh, I'm sorry, another question. Oh, yeah. Um, can you hear me? Um, I graduated high school in 1965, and in 1963, um, when we were in 10th grade, um, we read The Scarlet Letter, a uh, total classic, mm -hmm. uh, Far From the Matting Crowd, Thomas Hardy, mm -hmm. um, and I can go on and on, and uh, I, I'm sure they would be banned. Mayor of Casterbridge. Oh, exactly. Thomas Hardy. Yeah, you mentioned exactly. Thomas Hardy. So, you know, yeah. It, yeah. You know I, I don't know what's going on. We're going yeah. backwards. <laughs> if, if I could add another uh, comment. just. We've talked a little bit about Amendment 1 uh, that's on the ballot this year. You know, I said that there, you can vote two ways. There's yes, there's no, and there should be hell no. Mm -hmm. Because that, <laughs> the, the evil that would spring forth from that, not least of which is, if they made the, the elections partisan for school boards, we'd have ghost candidates who would That's drop right. in and try to eliminate all, anybody who wasn't of a particular party. And it would, it would disenfranchise hundreds of thousands of people mm -hmm. throughout the state, millions. It, 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 by the way, this uh, bill was proposed by um, Roach, uh, Spencer Roach, yep. up in Fort Myers. And it's the worst thing he ever came up with. I encourage everybody to vote against it. If you vote for nothing else, vote against this thing and get all your friends, colleagues, neighbors, and strangers to oppose this thing. It is absolutely one of the worst ideas ever to be put forth on a ballot. Share with all of your networks. Yes. Every single and person you know. And reach beyond your network. Yeah, and tell them to share the old, what was it, the shampoo commercial? <laughs> tell two mm -hmm. friends, and they mm -hmm. tell two friends, mm -hmm. and so on and so on. Yeah. Well, if there are no more questions, I just want to say thank you again to our panelists. This has really been wonderful. I really appreciate you all coming. <laughs>